Uh, so I'm Katie Culver. I am um, on the faculty in the School of Journalism and Mass Communication and also Associate Director of the Center for Journalism Ethics. I am married to a recovering sports reporter, the mother of student athletes, <laughs> and passionately interested in everything that we've been talking about today. I have been uh, just on pins and needles waiting for this conference. This is a tough role that the four of us have up here, summarizing the day, bringing it all together, looking for the connective tissue. But whenever I think about sports and media uh, today in the 21st century, uh, I think that connective tissue largely involves money. So we're going to get into power and dollars and cents up here. And um, I'm going to try to keep our conversation lively, not a lot of long remarks, and hopefully hold out a lot of time for questions. So get ready, especially you students, because I like to pick on you first. So I absolutely adored Bob Lipsight's conception that uh, sports matter, but there's something to matter with sports. So I'd like to start out there, and, and, I'll, and I will put the pop fly up to anybody who wants to take a swing at it. Uh, what do you see as the social importance of sports in our society today, and how is money connected to where we're going wrong with that? Uh, well, just to be provocative, I'll take on the great Bob Lipsight for a second, because uh, I actually think Things are great with sports. They're getting better and better. Um, and uh, I think it's an exciting time to be covering sports. Uh, you look around, um, with, take sport by sport just for a second. You know, the NFL, we have concussion protocols. We have a level of awareness now that we didn't have 10 years ago. NBA, Donald Sterling, 20 years ago, he still owns that team. Uh, you know, Bob spoke eloquently about what happened in 98 with. Uh, you know, the Sammy Sosa and the home run contest. Now we'd be laughing at those guys through either journalism or through our own awareness or through great strides that have been made otherwise. Um, I mean, look, there's always going to be problems and there's problems with everything. But I just think that we're getting to a point now with sports, and this really relates to sports journalism, you know, where a lot of that backroom stuff and a lot of the cover ups and a lot of the other things that used to go on aren't so easy to cover up anymore. And I think that, you know, that relates, and I'm sure we'll get into this later on about money, but um, I just, I'm very aware of the fact that I think we're actually entering into an exciting, very positive time in sports. You can find exceptions, but I don't know. I think that there's some really interesting things going on that make me disagree. And you're, you're absolutely part of the sunshine, but as soon as I asked you to start speaking, I realized I'm the worst moderator ever because I didn't introduce them in order. Minus 10 for me, <laughs> lower my grade. So Jim Miller, a journalist and author who literally wrote the book on ESPN. Steve Berkowitz, who in your programs is called Mary Byrne, but he's not. He's also from USA Today, but an investigative reporter, uh, through whom I learned the, uh, a lot about the inner workings of the money behind UW Athletics. Uh, it's a, a great little... Um, Great little service to all of us who make a lot less money than UW Athletics. And then finally, Greg Hughes, an alum of our fine University of Wisconsin-Madison and Senior Vice President for NBC Sports. So I'm sorry, back to question one now that I've done my duty. Um, you, I mean, I think if you're looking for the connection between money and everything in, in sports, I think that, that connection becomes uh, more and more prevalent as the money gets larger and larger. Um, and the money seems to get larger all the time. Um, we're told over and over and over again that, you know, at, that at some point uh, the money will stop going up and yet it continues to go up. Um, so I think that that still continues to play a big role in what's going on and what drives sports and part of what drives people's interest in sports um, even now as you get into uh, the, you know, into fantasy type of, uh, of sort of sports, almost sports betting now on stuff that it's even more, it, 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 even on that level that it's coming into it. Um, so I don't see that, I don't see that changing. There's an interesting sort of confluence that has happened where um, sports are the drivers of the television business now. More and more sports rights fees continue to go up because cable, satellite distributors pay more because sports are indispensable. People watch them live. You didn't tape the Wisconsin game on Monday night, so you could watch <laughs> it on Tuesday or Wednesday. It's not a Game of Thrones kind of thing. Um, 
and the interesting confluence is media is driving these higher salaries. The LA Dodgers have the highest payroll in baseball history. And the NBA, these guys are signing short-term contracts to get to 2016 so that they can sign these mega deals. You're gonna see contracts of 40 million a year for a LeBron James. That's what they're holding out for. And yet the press, as far as, so it's television companies like ours that are sort of you know, buying these rights and these leagues have all this money. And yet the media has pulled back significantly on covering the sports media, which to me is an odd confluence the way it's gone opposite directions. When I, I've been in this business now, round number 25 years. When I started, every paper, and there were multiple papers in big markets, had sports TV and sports media writers, and they covered this beat, and it was a competitive, driving landscape. And if you had a conference call with heavy hitters in the media, you'd have 50 or more reporters on it. Now, there are very few. And in the predictive world, in the 90s, what Steve was saying is, you know, at some point there's going to be a bubble and these sports dollars are going to go away. Hasn't happened yet. Still hasn't happened. And there's no real end in sight, if you want to put it that way. There's more rights coming up in the next year or two, the Big Ten, Premier League, et cetera. Those numbers are going to go up and significantly. I mean, so have we lost these people doing coverage of the business of sports to contraction in journalism in general? Or is it something that the audience doesn't care about so it's not news organizations aren't serving it? Well, well again, and it, it really, it doesn't matter to me significantly, but it strikes me that the driving force be behind what they're seeing from their certainly professional sports teams and franchises and the dollars they have and the dollars they're paying and these payrolls going way up is being driven by the rights fees that are being paid to these leagues. And the media has pulled away from covering the media companies that are supplying, which is odd. I think, that, I think it is partially a function of contraction. I mean, I can, like, I can only speak to that at the places that I'm familiar with uh, journalistically. But as people have uh, retired or people have been offered buyouts or things like that, that's been an area where uh, where it, it, it seems that many uh, media outlets have been willing to have been willing to pull back, that it, you know that you can't pull back on covering the NFL, or if anything, you have to cover the NFL even more than you had before, um, and that the number of positions that are available and the money that's available and the revenues that are available to media outlets uh, has made that has made those positions contract. And there's also been, I think, a little bit of a change also, in, again, in the, in the sort of where the, uh, the power center for that has, has gone. It used to be from, uh, from people in print, like where I, you know, at, at USA Today, where a guy like Rudy Martsky uh, or a guy like Jack Craig at the Boston Globe, who were the guys who sort of helped invent that whole genre of sports television coverage, that a lot of that has now gone online. Um, and there's, in, in some of it's not quite as mainstream, uh, but you have people who track this like on Awful Announcing, um, Deadspin, and some other places where those entities like didn't, you know, nobody had even thought of those things. Uh, and, you know, and you still have, it, it's just sort of a different, it's taken a different form. Right, but we were talking, somebody on an earlier panel was talking about mainstream media. I think it was Melissa was talking about mainstream, and this is one of the ways that bloggers and um, non-mainstream media have taken over that beat, and largely because they don't have to get out of their basements, if you want to put it that way. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's, you know, ethically, it's fraught. I mean, if you're talking about um, journalism serving the interests of the public, in this case, ser serving, I would argue, the interests of fans. I mean, we're, you know, where does the money come from? It comes from my season Badger tickets and my season, well, I wish I don't have them, paging Aaron Popke season Packer tickets, Ultimately, journalism should be representing those fans and cable subscribers. I mean, that's where the money is coming from. So we're not holding powerful interests to account, it sounds like you're saying, because of this contraction. Yeah, it, it just seems like an odd juxtaposition on the two sides. Although, although I mean, you, know, you, would, you, would, you would be able to speak to the coverage of ESPN uh, and how 
well that how, how extensively that's done or not done or how that's evolved over over the time that you've covered and you've written about the company. Well, I mean, look, you know, ESPN's interesting only be, if if only you can start right right away with the idea of the role of money because, I mean, what we're talking about now, John Skipper, who became president of ESPN four years ago. Uh, it was such a quantum shift in the way sports journal sports broadcasting took place. He went on one of the great buying sprees in the history of television. He fundamentally changed the equation because not only was he willing to pay more, he decided to pay more and for a lot longer. He firmly believed, I mean, he had basically one word when he went to, you know, try and get George's job, which was live. You know, before Skipper, there was, you know, a lot of original entertainment, and there was a lot of this and a lot of that, and he basically just said live. And what he did was he spent a lot of money, 15.3 billion on the Monday Night Football. I could go on and on, 27 billion on college football. And he decided that he was going to spend all this money, and it does two things. One is it immediately makes the moat of ESPN much bigger. So if you're Fox and you're trying to go up against ESPN, good luck. It's a 50 billion dollar proposition. You can't do it. You can't do it. You can do what NBC does, and you can zig while they're zagging. So they have the Olympics, and they have EPL, and they have NASCAR now, and they're doing something different. But Fox tried to go up against the ESPN, and they're failing miserably. They're hemorrhaging money. And so this idea of the money that has been expended by ESPN has been a fundamental game changer in, for not only the way ESPN operates, but for the way sports, sports broadcasting has been going on. And that, of course, affects then the journalism because basically for so many sports, people are covering what's on ESPN. And if live really is the game, if you're trying, if, if, if TV depends on live because it's not Game of Thrones, you can't time shift it, then that truly was a prophetic well, work. Well, Skipper, a, Skipper knows one thing, which is that four years from now, we have no idea if The Voice on NBC will be a hit anymore, right? American Idol isn't a hit anymore. But you know what? People are going to want to watch the Rose Bowl. So let's spend money on that. Interesting. So, so is there a dichotomy when it comes to the money between pro sports and college sports? Is that a, is that a bright line that we need to draw anymore, or, or am I just in, in wishing? What, in what capacity? You know, we don't pay college players for <laughs> the tremendous um, athletic contributions and achievements they make. Um, we pay professional players. So that's always been a line that people have drawn. When we pay one, we don't pay the other. But you're talking about rights deals, and, and you come across with college sports, the Rose Bowl. Does it matter in this big money world anymore, or, or is there really no difference between them? Well, I can tell you that part of what was being talked about at, an, at a conference at another university today uh, that I was, I'll, I'll have to admit I was cheating by listening to a piece of it earlier today, uh, involving Jeffrey Kessler. Uh, who's an attorney who's involved in one of the antitrust lawsuits against the NCAA. Um, in the eyes of those of, of folks who are taking on the NCAA in a really fundamental legal way, that whole notion of there being a line between college and pro, um, in their minds, that line basically doesn't exist anymore. And the NCAA is fighting like crazy to get courts to recognize that there is a difference. And whether there is or there isn't a difference, and the importance of there being a difference, and how that difference is drawn, may be the decider in whether or not uh, the NCAA ends up having its model blown apart uh, by federal courts. It seems like the money explosion is ultimately going to affect the NCAA model. Um, I don't think it's an if, I think it's a when. I think it's um, fundamental that as these dollars keep rolling and rolling and rolling, it's the decision becomes not if we should compensate athletes on the college level, but um, how we should compensate them. And I, it's a hard math equation, do you compensate the walk-on player the same as you compensate the starting quarterback, and, and it gets into a lot of these things. I mean, we're off the topic of journalism ethics now, but that's more a, uh, a bigger ethics problem, 
but it's but it is and then I, when I was talking about this in the breakout session that I that I was just involved with is that it, it there is the the ethical is it maybe not an ethical question in terms of like the appropriateness of coverage or whatever but it's an ethical question in terms of public policy issues that are raised um, by uh, how uh, big public college uh, athletics programs are operating and because of the underpinning of uh, tax exemption um, and tax deductibility of donations um, and the degree to and, and how the money that comes from uh, television networks into the conferences is shielded from taxation all of these and, and the use of uh, institutional resources to help underwrite athletics programs um, particularly when you get outside of the top 20 or so programs these are really become start to become significant public policy and education policy questions um, the whole notion of cost of attendance uh, that is being that's changing now in how a scholarship is defined starts to get into the, starts to push issues of how financial aid runs mm -hmm. in this country there are people who who are in financial aid offices on major college campuses here who are very concerned about the prospect of facing pressure from athletics departments about what constitutes cost of attendance and the impact that potentially could have on the entire uh, national financial aid model and the impact that can have on students across the board. Do you see that being, do you see those questions of collegiate sports being covered? Or is this also an area that we're, we're not seeing? I mean, I'm, Steve, I'm a, a big fan of your work. It, it um, moved aside a veil that, that had existed for a long time in my, my own institution. Uh, but I'm largely seeing the NCAA coverage as a legal case coverage, not these more fundamental, you know, what does the public think? What is in the best interest of these institutions, of these athletes, and of fans? I'm not, I don't think I'm seeing a lot of that coverage. How about the rest of you? Go ahead, you. Um, <laughs> you with this well, somehow. obviously, I'm not working hard enough. <laughs> um, I mean, we're trying. I mean, to be able to put it in that context, I mean, uh, when we uh, wrote recently about the basketball coaches' contracts and we try to put sort of narrative faces on these stories we write about them as opposed to just hammering the same thematic sort of findings over and over and over again. Um, when we uh, looked at this through the lens of what's going on at the University of Connecticut, uh, we tried to uh, juxtapose the increase in salary that Kevin Ollie had gotten in the wake of their winning the national championship. He was making 1.25 million, was headed to 1.5. They won a national championship. They tore up his contract and gave him a $3 million salary um, at a time when the University of Connecticut, for a variety of reasons, was having to increase its institutional, its general fund support of its athletics program uh, by a multiple of three. Uh, I mean, it's gone from it's gone up to 17 million dollars, uh, and you know, uh, in their most recent year. Now they fund their recreational department, the recreation department through their uh, intercollegiate athletics mm -hmm. department, which is unusual. But even when you compare Connecticut to itself, as opposed to any other institution, they've tripled the amount of money out of the general fund into the athletics department in a span of about five years. And so we're trying to be able to put these gigantic salaries for coaches where the money are so big that people, you know, it's like the, at a certain point you can't conceive of it anyway. You're trying to put it into some sort of framework of what you're talking about in, in those kinds of ways. And how does it affect, you know, what the, the, the way that schools are spending their money? How does it affect what students are paying in student athletics fees and things of that nature? Along the um, ethics lines, I don't think you'll see any papers in Connecticut digging into that issue. <laughs> uh, you know, and that's been a consistent theme throughout the day. The, right. the, the, the local media versus regional, national, traditional media players versus non-traditional media players. Uh, we've, we've heard some sort of honoring of legacy media here, but isn't there a place for the the dead spins and and these other there outlets is. to really be challenging those there is those the, norms. De the detachment is very helpful to what they can do and, and in the case of USA Today I'll speak as an outsider for you I mean you guys have the opportunity to 
parachute into certain places or to dig a little bit into some of these stories that deserve to be exposed where if you're the state journal here in Madison, I don't think you're gonna do a deep undercover dive into what's going on with Wisconsin athletics, uh, certainly not with your beat writers and your reporters who are gonna be covering these teams and these coaches and you're starting to write these things about and then there's this compensation and then there's that and, um, because you need the access, you need to have coverage of these teams as they develop and play well and get to the national championship game. You don't want to be that reporter or that group of reporters that's frozen out because of coverage that you've done. So it's almost left to the Times, USA Today, or the Deadspins or some of these non-attached enterprises to go ahead and say, hey, here's what's going on. And when it's the Times or USA Today, it has a little more credibility attached to it. Uh, sometimes the dead spins or TMZs or those kind are perceived as paying for stories or it's not quite as credible because of who they are for whatever reason. Whether that's real or not is borderline irrelevant, but that's how it's perceived. I, yeah. well, I, I can tell you that, that more and more papers on a local level are doing some of the coverage, type, types of coverage that we've been doing, and I, and I know this just from a competitive perspective, which is, you know, uh, so it's hard, it, it's getting harder and harder for us to, to find things that are new or have a ground that hasn't been covered. And I can also tell you from talking to open records office people at colleges across the country that more and more people are asking for these records because it's putting an increased workload on these, on these offices. <laughs> um, and um, so I can tell you anecdote, I mean, I, you know, can I give that to you empirically? Uh, no, but uh, anecdotally, I can, you know, I, I think that, that more, uh, there's been more attention uh, being paid to this. But yeah, for sure, it's harder, it's definitely harder uh, on some levels for local guys to do this. And not only, not, necessarily, not, not just, you know, for reasons out of access, but also for the demands that are placed on those beat reporters. It's like, you know, people are interested in what's going on in recruiting and what's going on with the team on the field and what's going on, and you got the one guy who's covering the basketball team and the football team and the baseball team and the seasons overlap and you know it's harder and harder because of the shrinkage in the industry for people to be able to make the time to do those sort of more time consuming enterprise type stories. Right, and I think, I mean, you know, not to defend the Wisconsin State Journal, but you know, I, I can say the word shoebox and it will strike fear into the hearts of Badger fans everywhere. You know, they uncovered that story. That, you know, there, 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 is a, there is a hard charging aspect to it. I think shrinking resources really do put tremendous pressure on those, those staff. They don't have the staff now in that newsroom that they had when that story was broken. Can we flip on the other side of it and, and ask, you know, is it the rise of ESPN and, and um, rights deals like your organization that is putting pressure on the institutions to do these things? You know, is the, you know, is UConn tripling that salary or more than doubling that salary because they're, they're swept up to, in this large money game with everybody else? Is college different now than it was 10 years ago because of those rights deals? I worked on an investigative series for the New York Times about college sports and money, and uh, we took a close look at Louisville, which was an interesting case study for us because it was a school that had literally coveted ESPN's attention. Um, they had gone, they had had a basketball program, but on the, on the football side of the equation, they wanted to be on, just like there's a couple other football teams that were willing to play on ESPN Tuesday nights, Wednesday nights, Sunday afternoon, Easter will show up as long as we can be on because it's great for recruiting, it's great for the brand. And so Louisville was very successful in engineering, you know, a new relationship uh, with ESPN. And so we followed the money, and um, the, the short answer is you can't blame ESPN for what happens then. Louisville had a new kind of revenue chain coming in, and they decided to dispense with that money the way that they wanted. I mean, ESPN's going to pay them that, they're going to pay that league, okay, their rights under, under that league's uh, negotiation. But they can't micromanage where that money is going to be spent on the on, on, you know, on the actual campus. I mean, and so it, you gotta be careful where you, you know, where you throw the blame. And it goes, 
it literally goes the same for you, for you guys on some of your deals too. I mean, you're paying, you know, you're paying at 30,000 feet and how those schools decide to spend it um, is something well, that's beyond the control. There, there's no question, like the Masters is going on right now. Probably one of the, probably the last example of a, an organization that uh, controls their media rights down to how much airtime, how much commercial time. How much Chris Berman can be there. Yeah, how much Chris Berman can be there, <laughs> which is not at all. Um, Are you kidding? You're joking. No. You're anyway, good. how about those Knicks? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, but these leagues, frequently television gets the blame for late start times. The game the other night, Monday night, in the Eastern time zone started at round number 920 Eastern. But really, it's the NCAA that controls the time of the game. It's not CBS. They, if the NCAA said, hey, we want to start that game at 8 o'clock, then they could, but they would get less money in their rights deal. And that's what Augusta National does is, this is when our air times are, these are the hours that you can use, and you can only have, I think it's three sponsors, right? I At Augusta so. National, it's yeah. three. That's it. So here's what we want for these rights, you can pay it or not. And CBS is in their 60th year of paying for those rights. So it's not really, you know, you follow the money after it's gone, but the leagues and these uh, college um, conferences are taking the big paycheck. And where the money goes from there is not really anybody's uh, fault on the media side. By the way, I will tell you that this, the story, because of the series of stories that you guys did on, with, a, with uh, Louisville, right? And that, I mean, it was really, really good stuff. I mean, if you have the chance to go back and look it up and find it, um, Google it, it's really, really smart stuff. No, oh, thank you. Um, but I, I will tell you that from the, from the television end of this, you, you want to sort of see sort of where, you know, if you follow the money in one end and you want to see sort of how it goes around and around and comes out the other side, for example, um, and I'll do this at your expense, uh, <laughs> the uh, NBC, NBC Sports Network is, has a deal with the Atlantic 10. Yes. And so they're among, they're among there's a, uh, ESPN does stuff with the Atlantic 10, um, the part of the way that VCU was able to hold on to their basketball coach, Shaka Smart, for as long as they were able to until he finally went to Texas, was under a contract arrangement where he was given uh, what they called bonus compensation. It, was, it wasn't part of his base salary, but one component of his package involved, uh, he would get a $6,500 payment for every time VCU played a men's basketball game on national television which was defined as being on either the NBC Sports Network or ESPN or whatever. Well, this past season, because the team had gotten to be pretty good, VCU played on TV 24 times. Uh, so as a result, Chaka Smart's pay from the school went up by $156,000 as a result of the number of games they played on television. Now, VCU ends up getting a certain cut of that television rights fee. Well, a certain amount of that cut of that television rights fee went right into Shaka Smart's pocket. I mean, when it comes to the journalism part of the equation, it's a tricky business, right? So that's why uh, it, the onus is so high on ESPN, because they have so much money involved with these leagues that they show their independence, and they take these leagues on, and they prove that they're not, that there is this wall between programming and, you know, and the journalism side of it. And, you know, uh, I, I think that they've, They've done a you know rather amazing job, but it also means that when things like League of Denial happen, it gives people who want to be looking for something you know like a little scratching of their head. But um, it's a very difficult thing to pull off. Well, I was just about to say you know you're giving them credit for doing a very good job, and and you know a lot of what I heard today, especially from Mark, was surprising to me because I don't think the public perception is that that. Chinese wall is as high as maybe people, you know, in Bristol think it is. You know, the, the public perception for many people when they pulled out of the Frontline series was, huh, see, I told yeah, you, virtually that's what's every, been going on all along. Virtually every speech I give after with the Q&A, they say, you know, how about all the conflict of interest, the, uh, you know, with ESPN? And I say, you know, so can we talk about some of the examples? I mean, I'm not here to show for ESPN, but, you know, I think it's just one of those things that, it's easy to say just because they're so big and they're, you know, they have so much money. Um, but when you really get down to it, 
I mean, that was, was so interesting for me, at least, to write about legal denial, because it was one of those moments where you saw, I mean, Playmakers was another example, but um, we don't get that many opportunities to see up close where, where, the, where the, basically the water goes over the levee, and it just, it gets to the point where Roger Goodell is, you know, yelling at John Skipper at Patroon, and um, Burbank says, you know, let's get out of this thing. Yeah, Playmakers was the entertainment show that ESPN did for right. a year that was based on, essentially based on NFL players, and, and it was successful. It was doing very well, and it lasted one season and was canceled, and largely because the NFL didn't like the show. Well, they made the mistake of running an ad for Playmakers on Monday Night Football. And the thing about Monday Night Football is it's the one night where all the owners and all the teams watch football. So, you know, you can hide it on Sunday because some people won't see it, but they ran this ad on Monday night, and uh, Michael Eisner got a call at his house, and, you know, probably two minutes later. And that was the end of Playmakers. But, um, but my only point is those things are generally outliers. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot of money. By the way, an interesting fact for you guys if you're interested. In 1990, 20% of ESPN was up for sale and nobody wanted it. You know, it's always easy for people to say, oh yeah, we saw it coming. You know, you put a bunch of fourth graders in a room and say, these people over here make their money through advertising and these people over here make their money through advertising and subscription fees. Which team's gonna win? It's like, well, the guy's over there. But that's, guess what? KKR, the brilliant strategists, they were, they were getting rid of it. Cap Cities, Tom Murphy, Dan Burke, two of the great giants of broadcasting, could have had that extra 20%, didn't want it. It was only because Hearst had a tax certificate which was expiring at the end of the year. I, I'm not making this up that they could use it and they said, and they had a relationship with ABC stations, so they said, okay, we'll, we'll, we'll buy it. And they bought it, it was ridiculous, cheap. And uh, you know, ESPN will do over 11 billion in revenues right now. Burbank is, uh, uh, this year they'll do over, they'll do over 11 billion in revenues and Disney stock without ESPN is, well, hide all women and children, it would be awful. <laughs> hide all women and children, well, it, the, the people on the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel sports staff just had a small coronary event and they don't know why with that multi-billion dollar yeah. number. So I'd like to flip over to the, the non-moneyed side of the equation right now and, and some of the ethical challenges for sports journalism that are posed by new ways to fund sports journalism. So, you know, Steve, I'm not gonna make you speak for USA Today because you're a reporter, not the sports editor, but USA Today has entered into some new arrangements um, with you know, IndyCar, for instance, where they're going to be increasing the amount of coverage. Right. They say it's not going to affect editorial decisions, but I don't know how increasing the amount of coverage isn't an editorial decision. But some of these brand content arrangements, um, partnering with teams, leagues, um, whole sports, saying that you're going to increase the amount of racing coverage, what are the ethical concerns that those arrangements pose, and if those are so great, how else are we gonna fund this? Uh, you really want me to answer this question, right? Well, I'm saying you can take a powder. I'm looking at Hughes <laughs> down there. He can go first. Yeah. <laughs> I don't want you to do anything uncomfortable. I, I, you know, I try to minimize yeah. harm. It's a very important journalistic ethic. Thanks. <laughs> um, I, I don't think USA Today is alone. I think, um, mm -hmm. I think this happens across, and over the last, in round number, let's call it 10 years, as the digital landscape has unfolded and put more pressure on the traditional model, that more and more you're seeing these advertising editorial lines blur. And, and I think, is that bad for fans? On some level it is. Um, I, I think it depends on the sport. It depends on what's going on. We were talking earlier, somebody was bringing up um, Chris Fowler and saying, hey, some of these things we just aren't, you know, we have to look the other way and not talk about. Um, and I think that largely the audience that tunes in to games doesn't necessarily want to be lectured on the potential for knee injuries or head injuries or anything. If every time you tuned into a game, you were at the beginning of the game, they said, now remember, this is football and people are going to get hit in the head and there will be concussions. Be like, I don't want to hear this, I want to see the Packers and Bears. That's what I tune in for. So there are those lines, but um, with a newspaper, it's kind of the same thing. I'm not sure that we all uh, 
read USA Today or a lot of local papers um, to get some of these deeper facts. We want to know what the competitive landscape is for these teams that we follow, the sport that we follow, whether it's IndyCar. I'm not sure that we need to look under the hood all the way on IndyCar. I, I have a buddy from business school who's running a company that owns a bunch of local papers. And you know what? He's trying to save jobs. And if that means changing the equation a little bit, you know, I think what that requires then is transparency to the consumer and you let people know that, you know what, X is now Y and we're, we've, we've changed our kind of covenants a little bit. But, you know, my heart goes out to these people in these boosins because they're desperate to save their jobs and the circulation is going down and their value proposition to the, you know, to their readers that, you know, used to be incredibly loyal to them is, is shrinking. And so, if there are mechanisms like this that can be done, you know, I do think it's an obligation to, to tell your audience that, you know, you have this kind of arrangement, but if that's going to help save some jobs and keep them in business longer, so be it. And I, I don't disagree. And, and these, the teams and leagues have developed their own media outlets and people accept those. People go to NFL.com or NASCAR.com and get their news with the knowledge that we're not going to get all of the news and we're not going to get in-depth coverage of it, but I'm going to get kind of what I want here. But have um, we really had that ethical conversation? I mean, that puts a lot of onus on the audience. That expects that they understand things about accountability and independence that, I, you know, I, I'm, not, I'm not quite sure they do. And, and Is that I, realistic? I think it was uh, Chris Cluey who said um, that they're not that smart. I mean, that a lot of people who are reading these things aren't. But I also believe that they're getting what they want. I mean, and But isn't part of journalism giving people what they might not want, but what they need? I mean, or, or I'm what a Packer journalist... fan. I don't want to know about con concussions, but I need to know about con concussions. I needed yeah. legal denial. I didn't go looking for it, but I needed it. Is, I mean, isn't there an argument for that? Th there definitely is, but I think um, the people who are interested in that do find that kind of stuff. I mean, if you really want to look into, especially in today's digital world where you can type one or two words into your phone and bang a whole bunch of information on any given topic come up, I think that the people who want to be informed are the people, if you want to define it as need to be informed, it's not really government necessarily um, with the NFL or NASCAR and some of the safety issues. I think people do need to be informed as these things bubble up to the surface. But then, like I say, they don't want to be beaten over the head with them. But, and you know, maybe of small comfort, but it's also not a binary existence because just because something happens in a deal with NASCAR doesn't mean that you're going to stop doing the work that you're doing. Do you feel affected by any of the, I mean, USA Today does have a number of different deals, you know, Starbucks and race being one of them that was quite ethically interesting this month. Do you feel any, any implicit or explicit pressure in this new, you know, in, in a world where we're trying to find new ways to, to underwrite journalism? Uh, as a reporter, I don't feel any pressure at all. I mean, I go out and do what I do. Um, you know, I mean, are we aware of what what's going on, uh, you know, yeah, I mean, uh, you, and, and, and um, you know, like I said, you, it would, would there be, you know, I, I, on a personal, on a personal level, you know, uh, how that, how that goes, you got to see, see how it rolls. I mean, and, I mean, but so far, uh, there's been no indication in our newsroom that I'm aware of that somebody has been prevented from writing something or pursuing something based on any of these arrangements, whether it's with, uh, you know, whether it's with the IR, with the, the Racing League or, you know, or anybody else, you know, or hotels where, where USA Today distributes the paper or, or, or anything else. That I, that, I mean, it, it, there's been, like I said, there's been nothing. In fact, it can help. I, uh, you know, I had an ESPN writer who told me that, uh, you know, he, he wanted me to uh, do a story about how many times Mike and Mike say progressive insurance during their, 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 their show. And I said, I can't count that high. No, I said <laughs> that those, um, those mentions of progressive actually may mean that, you know, the next investigative trip that you go on, you know, there's some extra money. I, you know, it all, it's, it's called capitalism. 
Well, part of the reason there is a sports section is to underwrite the other civic coverage in the paper. You know, the most read section of the paper for a long time, people said, is this really worth us having it in here? But it, it helps send the reporter to cover the city council. Uh, so over the course of the day, we talked a lot about uncovering stories and investigations. And you know, if you went back into the 90s as what was the blissful phrasing as the baseball players began to balloon, and we saw that as the you know, sort of great uncovered story um, we weren't paying attention to and you know, concussions in football. Is there anything out there now that you think we're just not looking at sufficiently? We're not paying enough attention to it in sport? I'll go first. Uh, I mean, you know, again, I have, I, have, I have to admit that I have a certain myopia about what I'm doing because of the the way because of what I do on a day to day basis. Um, I would argue I mean, you have a certain passion for it. Okay. I wouldn't call that's it. A, I wouldn't call in, it myopic. You're, oh, <laughs> you're, yeah, I'll, you're it's in my very kind of you to say that. <laughs> um, you know, I mean, I'm constantly trying to find new ways to take the information that we have and put it out in a different way. Um, that we've taken, for example, some of the financial uh, information that we've gotten about uh, expenditure that by schools and trying to bring some other things to light with it. For example, we've done this past year, we talked about uh, during this football, during, the, during this recruiting cycle and during this basketball season, talking about the uh, amount of money that schools spend recruiting athletes. And that was something that we were pulling out of those reports. So we're trying to find ways to bring other of those kinds of things, uh, other of those kinds of things to light. I mean, I think, um, you know, it, it's hard for me to imagine that there isn't something, there, there, there isn't always something new to be uh, found inside of even what I'm doing, uh, which, you know, people have said to me, geez, it's a, you know, how do you do what you do? And you just, just do the same thing over and over and over and over again. And, um, I'm, you know, constantly trying to find sort of a new, you know, sort of a new angle on it, a new piece to it. I don't have any doubt that there are a lot of things out there that um, remain covered up that we should maybe be aware of. But I think uh, one of the real positives of the digital world is in 1998 when that reporter saw uh, Andro in Mark McGuire's locker, that would have been tweeted about. And that issue would have bubbled to the surface much more quickly than it did. And there would have been discussions on nightly news about why would this guy have Andro in his locker as this. Um, so I think probably those who might be doing things that are either nefarious or um, things that maybe some are aware of that the rest of us aren't have to be much better at keeping them covered up nowadays. I'd probably like to see, I don't know, I, I mean, I love the tech stuff. and. Uh, I think sometimes, um, from a press point of view, we're too reactive to maybe what Tim Cook is unleashing or something else. I mean, you know, technology is expanding so quickly that the way that we're going to consume sports content, even in five years, um, is going to be fundamentally different than now. And I just, I still, you know, I find no matter how many kind of tech things I blog and stories I follow on Twitter, I still am looking for you know, really imaginative, really proactive analysis of, you know, are we going to have, for instance, you know, a paradigm like iTunes Store where I can go on like a menu and I can click on, I don't have to have my cable package, I can click on, you know, the, the uh, Yankees Red Sox game tonight for $1.99 and I'll watch it on the set. I mean, that's got to be around the corner. I mean, what, how are we going to, you know, and how is that going to affect, you know, all these right deals and stuff? But I'm just, I think we're in a really, really, dynamic moment in terms of technology and sports. I mean, obviously things have been changing, but we're still focused on the size of our TV and whether it's curved or, you know, whether, okay, we can watch it on our iPads and now we got authentication. We're, I'm talking about like a quantum change that's coming in, the, you know, five or 10 years. And I would love there to be more really cool reporting about that. It shouldn't be just about gadgets. It should be about sports content. It should be about, about putting the audience in control of that sports content and, and you know, yeah. cut it, cutting well, the cord. What would that do for your model? Um, well, you know, we're, all of us are in the process of adjusting our models. You know, with the Olympics at NBC, 
in 2010, Vancouver, the tablet basically didn't exist. By 2014, in Russia, half of America has a tablet. So the offerings that we put out there and we put everything out there alive, we adjusted our model. And our revenues from London, um, our digital revenues doubled going into Sochi, and they will double or more again for the Rio games because we know that people are using these different platforms, so we've got to adjust our game as it goes. And I think you're gonna continue to see that. What we do now be to sort of prevent that sort of thing from overtaking us is we buy what we call Olympic style rights. And we have those for Premier League, for other sports that we cover where we own the digital rights, we own the full platform rights so that we can advantage ourselves. Because if you only own the linear rights to put it on television, somebody's gonna be streaming it and it costs you a lot of money. Like they're pulling eyeballs away from you. So you have to find a way to aggregate all the eyeballs across all of the platforms. And um, we're gonna see, but I think you're gonna see a, a big adjustment again on the digital side. The Rio Olympics are gonna be live. Was the Sochi live decision, um, was that almost entirely about hitting them on those new platforms or was any of it a reaction to, you got some pretty significant consumer pushback on London, right? The, NBC fail well, hashtag and because you weren't, well, right, weren't uh, running it live. Well, the, no, the funny part. Is there a part, response to that at all? Yeah, the, with London, we ran everything live online. But that was sort of the bridge we had to cross. And Jim mentioned authentication. Authentication is something that, again, I would say four years ago in this room, everybody would say, what is that? But now many of you have probably done it, where you put in your credentials and you can watch on a different platform TV everywhere has happened. The London Olympics largely moved TV everywhere, everywhere way ahead of where it was before because we put everything live online. And so the hashtag NBC fail was largely because some of those people didn't have access to cable or satellite and therefore couldn't watch live. So we put everything on live online, but we saved stuff for the primetime show for the people who are at work and they want to see a curated version of uh, that day's events, whether it's Michael Phelps swimming or anything else. And so when we got to Sochi, all of a sudden you don't see hashtag NBC fail because we train the audience. And then we got, I got thank yous from Fox, ESPN, CBS, from all these guys about, hey, you guys did us all a big favor because now people are authenticated and now on their platforms, they're pushing people. So by the time we got to Sochi, it wasn't out there at all because people figured out, okay, if I wanna watch it live online, I've gotta have a cable satellite distribution subscription or a way to log in and get that, or I'm just gonna have to watch it on NBC at night on over-the-air free television. So again, it's an adjustment, but we push people through that and now it's, it's a non-issue for us. We knew it was gonna be in London. We had a lot of meetings about it and we just decided to uh, charge the uh, bridge and go for it. Ooh, weather, weather the storm. Yeah. So I have uh, two summary questions, but I'm gonna turn to questions from the audience if you guys have some. It's the Olympics are unquestionably a news event, enormous public resources spent on it, but the rights are for sale. So NBC News has a fundamental conflict about covering the Olympics. You won't see a negative story likely on any of the platforms of NBC. The competitors have a conflict of interest in that they don't want to necessarily promote what's on NBC, and they can't get into the events to cover them anyway. So how do you bridge the journalism of the Olympics? Well, I would say your initial premise is off. Um, we have a significant uh, divide between church and state with NBC News and the NBC Sports Group when it comes to the Olympics. And in Russia, you remember they passed some LGBT laws that were very restrictive over there going into the Olympics. Uh, you know, I made an example earlier of every time we put on a football game, people don't want to hear now. These guys can get concussed, they can hurt their knee. And the same thing goes for the people tuning in to primetime 
NBC Olympics coverage. They want to see Michael Phelps swim. They want to see the gymnastics team perform. Um, but NBC News is kept separate, and they reported many times about what was going on within Russia. Uh, Richard Engel was every night reporting about some issue going on in that country on nightly news. Um, so we try to keep that independence, but as the sports group, we, our decision was and remains, if something newsworthy happens that affects the Olympic competition, we'll cover it within our programming on the sports side. Or if it's, you know, the editorial judgment is made, we'll let NBC News take over our air. If there's some sort of mega event, like a terrorist type event at a venue, NBC News would take over NBC and would handle the coverage of that. That's not for necessarily Bob Costas or our announcers at a venue to handle. Um, so I see your point about the other news organizations. Um, that's an editorial choice on their part. If they see covering the Olympics as uh, helping NBC, you know, a little bit shame on them. I, I think Good Morning America and some of the other shows did um, do a lot of Russia coverage. I think they tried to attach themselves because the Olympics are such a um, cohesive event. I mean, it's the one event every two years that families gather around their TVs to watch. So I think, um, you know, our stance is that, you know, news covers news, we cover sports, and what the rest of them do is kind of on them. I, just, just to push back, having been on the inside at NBC for many years, I know there's a good deal of self-censorship that goes on, um, but I, you can't, I can't ask you to speak for NBC News from, from the sports side, but I'm just, all, I'm just also curious about sort of the other journalistic conflicts from the others on the panel as well. Um, you know, how, how do you, has, has the money and the rights fees corrupted the journalism involved in what is clearly a news event? Are you, you just, um, you know, corrupted is probably an aggressive term. I, I think it influences it. I think it certainly does, but I think we saw this with the Ray Rice case um, this past fall on the NFL. I think every network that is an NFL rights holder covered that extensively. But what it exposes is, are you guys as aggressive as you would be if you weren't an NFL rights holder? Um, and it, it's a really hard chasm to cross. I mean, maybe so. I mean, we may have done exactly the same thing if we weren't, but you're still judged through that prism of, oh, we think you would have done more. So I, I think it has an influence certainly on the per perception, if maybe not the reality. But I, I remember CBS, the opening night of their Thursday night coverage um, this past fall, they, had, uh, they did a panel discussion about the Ray Rice situation, and they ended up eliminating the Rihanna opening song uh, that they had done uh, for their Thursday nights, and they, they had a whole bunch of plans for how they would open it, and instead opened with a big discussion about that. So I'm not gonna sit here and say it has no influence at all, but I think it's probably more limited than you think. You know, to Jim's point about ESPN, they're pretty aggressive about covering the issues of the day within these organizations. What do you guys think? Um, I mean, as far as USA Today's coverage of the Olympics goes, I mean, I, you know, we, the only uh, governor on our coverage of the Olympics has been the resources available. I mean, USA Today has gone, traditionally gone in uh, real heavy on covering the Olympics. And this goes back, you know, years, goes back before, before I started working for USA Today. I mean, and I just sort of knowing the culture of the place, I mean, it was because of the perception of it being that's, you know, the United States team. And so, you know, the, the, the paper went in big on the Olympics and has, it's remained a huge event. I mean, USA Today sends more people between USA Today and Gannett, that sort of conglomeration. I mean, we're, I, I believe we now send more people to an Olympics basically than any news organization other than NBC or whomever is, is the rights holder at this point. The other part of it is, you know, the Don Van Nattas of the world, they take their jobs pretty seriously. And uh, 
institutional secrecy is almost like an oxymoron nowadays. I mean, I hear from somebody at ESPN every day. I, c I could spend my life, I can't monetize Twitter, but I could spend my life literally tweeting about ESPN every day. I mean, if, if you are an investigative reporter at ESPN and you're told that you can't write about something because, you know, of the relationship of the league, I mean, you're going to go to DEF CON 1 and you're going to talk to everybody you can and you're going to make a noise about it, even if you're most, the most loyal employee. And, you know, during League of Denial, there were actually groups of people at ESPN talking to other groups of people and managers were talking. It was, you know, it was a cultural moment for them because of that perception. And so I don't think it happens, you know, I don't think it happens with pro football talk at NBC. I don't think, I mean, I, I don't, I'm not sure it happens as much as we'd like to think it does. It's a kind of cool narrative to think, oh, you know, the NFL is owning this and stuff, but I don't think so. I'm the moderator. Do I get to answer, though? Go ahead. Because <laughs> I'm going to push back on the pushback of the pushing back um, and say that, you know, with the Ray Rice story in particular, um, that there was a tremendous suspension of skepticism on that story in the early going of that story until TMZ released the, the, the video that was we no longer could deny. I mean, I remember I almost threw my shoe through my TV the, the morning um, of the, the breaking of the first story, watching CBS News put on a CBS Sports football analyst who said the equivalent of, we don't know what happened in that elevator before she came, before she was dragged out unconscious. So I, you know, there are explicit um, constraints, you know, telling Charlie Rose you need to say this on the CBS Morning News, and I think that is really limited. I think that's very, very limited. But then there are also these, these implicit constraints that we all say, mm, maybe I don't want to push that far because we have the rights deal. And that's much harder to quantify and I think also much more dangerous ethically. Well, it's interesting you say that though because, uh, again, the spotlight gets put on the NFL partner networks um, and gee, they didn't question what did they think happened in that elevator. But you could also say that the New York Times saw the same thing and didn't question it apparently in the Wall Street Journal and name any other organization, but the spotlight goes to the NFL partners that somehow you guys ignored it. Well, that's a th great point. There's a lot of other people who ignored it too in the media business. And, and I don't think there was any you know, maliciousness in it. I think people overlooked it, uh, misinterpreted it, and were wrong across the board. But I, I don't think that's unique to just the networks that cover it. It's, yeah. I don't think the New York Times ran a story about, hey, what happened in that elevator, and did they call and try to get the security video, and did they make all of those things? They knew the same things the networks did. And you can't conflate two, I mean, look, with journalism, right, I mean, nobody bats it. The entire journalistic community missed, you know, weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. That story just kind of like, well, so it's like, was there, it's because they had rights with Iraq? No, I mean, there was this, I mean, obviously, they just got it wrong. I mean, so sometimes people, sometimes people get it wrong. You can't conflate it with missing something and then necessarily, and it's inextricably linked to the fact that you have a deal with the league. Right, I think it's very dangerous to presume these, these causal connections, but there is an entity that got it right on Iraq, and the McClatchy Papers got it right, and it was largely because of their right. outsider status. Um, and it was sort of the, the inside baseball game to come back to sports um, that, you know, that's where a lot, of the, a lot of the problems arose from. And so if you're, if you're saying that you have these, you know, this community of sports journalists very tightly knit and they're all playing this inside game, then maybe you do need TMZ saying, we're charging hard until we get that video because they're the outsiders. Maybe, TMZ, maybe. though, that, the problem is they're going to pay for people to get video. So once we start getting video, then that's a game changer. But they have different covenants. They're going to, I could hire TMZ right now to find out everything about you and to follow you for the next four days. And, they, and they'll do it. And they'll get stuff that, you know, I mean, a reputable journalistic entity wouldn't do. So That Jim Miller would be the most boring video <laughs> in the history of video. Katie Culver and her beige minivan. They would, I'm telling you. They would take it. All right, let's jump to another question. How about right here? Um, I think that the one of the, well, first of all, I think, it, NBC's Sunday night um, football package is like not just the best sports broadcasting, but among the best broadcasting. It just like pushes the envelope, especially when it comes to technology. And in, in that regard, I'm I'm wondering what sorts of conflicts or you know arguments or just even negotiations go on between 
the television network, the journalists, and the league in terms of what, what you want to do with the broadcast and what they will allow you to do with covering the game. I mean, we now have cameramen rushing onto the field after touchdowns. They're literally inside the lines. The, the amount of replay is just unbelievable. And it's, it, it, it came to a point here in Wisconsin this last week where we saw how far advanced football is above all other sports when the referees in the Duke game didn't have the same access to the replay that the viewers did. I, every viewer at home saw the ball go off the kid's finger and the referees did not because they didn't have access to it. Obviously, that's not the case in the NFL. Right. Yeah, it was one of those odd moments, wasn't it, where everybody at home that you know, could be watching with 100 people in a bar or whatever and everybody's a Wisconsin fan is high-fiving when they see that one replay. All right, it's going to be our ball. We get the ball back. Somebody tweeted, if only the NCAA could afford a bigger TV. Yeah. <laughs> but but then, then they walk out on the court, the refs, and they go the other way. It was shocking. But um, thanks for your comments about Sunday Night Football. Those largely, the credit goes to Fred Goodelli and Drew Esikoff and our production team. And I will say, they push the envelope on everything. Um, one of the untold stories of what we do on Sunday Night Football is they will run a practice game in a stadium using high school kids, using a high school team, so that they can get all of the camera angles on sideline shots and end zone shots and make sure that things are in place and these guys are asked to run a simulated game. And they're flattered and honored to do it. Um, so a lot of attention to detail goes into that. The league is far less influential about those things, and I, I give them credit for it. The NBA is much more heavy-handed, having worked at Turner for a long time. They're a lot more influential with your broadcasters and what you do. Um, the NFL is very cooperative and open, and you know things are done out there on the field, and you have replays, and you have um, access to Dean Blandino, who's the head of officiating with the NFL. They make themselves available. There's no hiding behind anything, and we do everything we can to give the viewing audience the best view of that game possible and the best commentary possible, and a lot goes into that. But I would say the NFL, they want their, you know, we're the prime time home, real, it's the number one show in prime time for the last four years, Sunday Night Football. I think the NFL likes that status of having that show, and they don't want to have negative influence over what goes on in that show. We're responsible with the content and what we show, and uh, it's been proven out over the last several years. So. Have, have grown since this show? <laughs> <I'm really kidding. laughs> D dis discussed, sure. I mean, but that's about as far as well, that's the FAA got. says not inside a stadium right now. Right. Uh, so I certainly hope none of those high school players get concussed during those practice no, games. No, no, no. So, no. <laughs> so I'm sorry, I, I apologize. That, that we, I can go on for a whole other hour here, uh, but we do have to um, wrap up. So I want to I thank the panelists. I also want to thank um, everybody for being here today. Um, Bob is going to do the formal farewell, but I do think, you know, in, in classes when we talk about ethics and, and in a lot of the writing for the Ethics Center, we, we say, you know, really, who in their right mind would set out to be unethical? You know, there are very few among us who say, well, wake up today and be immoral. Um, but th these conversations have to be about what the countervailing forces are. And um, I think speed is a problem. I think competition can be a problem. And I think money, as we've talked about here today, can really be a powerful countervailing force um, when we're talking about ethics and sports journalism. So thank you so much for exploring the topic. And I'll turn it over to Bob. Well, uh, I usually go into a nasty droop in the afternoon, uh, about 1.30 or so. For some reason, that didn't happen today. And I would guess, I would hope that it didn't happen to any of you either. Um, I've been sort of searching for some generalizations to make that capture the day and summarize conclusions. And I've kind of given up in the sense that it's not easy to do that because we've covered so much ground. Uh, have we come to consensus on any uh, ideal solutions to the pressing issues we've identified? Of course, not really. Um, and as one panelist said this morning, you can't really solve ethical problems simply by writing specific ethical codes. But uh, one thing I think we have learned today or had confirmed for us today is that ethics is 
also something we can look at as a process. And the first step in that process is uh, talking through um, problems and recognizing and isolating issues. And I think we've certainly done a good share of that. And then you can advance towards solutions, or at least conclusions, because we may not agree on those, uh, with discussion, and we've certainly had plenty of that. So I want to end the day as we began it, or at least as I began it, with some thanks. And you can see again the names of our sponsors on the screen, but let me start my um, list of thanks with thanks to our panelists, to our speakers, to our moderators who have been I think just terrific all day. Um, I want to thank uh, the staff of the Ethics Center, my colleagues at the Ethics Center, uh, very much for all the work they have put in. And we're going to lose Dave Wilcox, our project assistant, to a job at Marquette next year. So uh, that's going to leave us with uh, quite a hole to fill. Uh, other people I want to thank, most definitely, I suspect he's not here, but many of you uh, participants dealt with him, and that's Rowan Calix in our uh, main journalism office, who was a wizard at managing all of the travel arrangements and troubleshooting uh, the problems that many people had with their uh, travel. Uh, I want to mention Mike Meyer, one of our grad students who very early on in the process, way back last fall, Mike was uh, very helpful in helping us think through who might be good participants, who might be good panelists, what might be some good issues for us to take up. Jack Mitchell and the Shadid Award Committee, and uh, part of that committee also uh, is uh, Judy Frankel, who has um, for several years uh, volunteered to handle a lot of the logistics, on the, particularly on the front end of the uh, whole process. I want to thank our Center Advisory Board, uh, they are absolutely terrific. Uh, they help us generate ideas. They've helped us find financial resources uh, to support the center and particularly to support the conference. Jen Carlson, our UW Foundation liaison, who has also been very helpful in regard to finances. Uh, Andy Hall and the Wisconsin Center for Investigative Journalism, which this year we were able to, thanks to Andy, we were able to collaborate on sharing some um, participants and panelists um, for which we are incredibly grateful. And again, to our sponsors uh, who really, it's, if they didn't have the uh, confidence in our putting on this conference effectively and believe in what we were doing, of course, we wouldn't have a conference here at all. And finally, I can't help uh, but mention that if you've really enjoyed this day and you go to our website, ethics.journalism.wisc.edu, there is a dandy little donate button that you can click up in the right-hand corner of the screen and see how that works out. But uh, seriously, thank you. Well, I'm serious about that, too. But thank you. <laughs> thank you very much for coming today. Um, it's been a great day, I think. And um, we hope you'll come back Watch for our uh, conference next year. We don't know what the theme is going to be, but we'll have one by early fall. And so we hope you'll come back then. So give yourselves and everybody else uh, a hand and uh, enjoy the rest of the day.